Hi everybody, Physics Ninja here and welcome to my video on the Brachistochrone problem. I haven't looked at this problem in over 20 years and I've been interested lately, I've been thinking about it and I saw some other videos on the Brachistochrone problem um, that made me want to look at it in more detail. So I decided to make a video on what I've learned about it. Um, I have three parts to this video. All right, in the first part, we're gonna look at the Brachistochrone problem. We basically have two fixed points and the goal is, I want to create a shape. Imagine I gave you a wire that you can bend in any direction that connects both of these endpoints. I place a bead on that wire, and only gravity acts to speed it up or to slow it down. What is the shape of the wire that you should pick if my goal is to get the bead to go from one point to the other in the shortest amount of time? All right? That is the brachistochrome problem. So in the first part, what we're going to do is we're simply going to derive an expression. What if I gave you an arbitrary function y of x? How do you calculate the time to go from one point to another? That is pretty straightforward. The expression's here given in uh, the equation here for total time. In part two, what we're going to show is I'm going to use the Euler-Lagrange formalism in order to actually show that uh, the Brachistochrone problem, the solution to it, is something known as the cycloid. So we'll talk about the cycloid in detail and how you can actually get to these expressions for the position of that particle in the xy plane. Uh, in the third part of my video, what I want to do then is I want to compare the brachistochrone to two other curves. I'm going to consider the shortest path between those two points, which is a straight line, and another segment, this red curve here, where there's a sharp drop, so the B would speed up, but then it has longer to go. We're actually going to use our expression for time in order to calculate the time for these three curves. All right, at the end, you're going to see that the Brachistochrone solution is indeed, at least for these three, is the fastest. All right, this video involves quite a lot of math, right? So if you don't want to look at the whole video or only interested in a certain part, just skip to that part, right? I have the times uh, written uh, in this introduction here. All right, like with all my videos, if you like it, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing to my channel. It's the best way to support what I do. All right, let's get started. All right, the first uh, part of the proof is to show that our total time to go from the origin up here all the way to our final fixed point, a comma b, for any arbitrary path, right, for any function y of x, that I can write that total time by this expression. Now, it looks kind of complicated, but uh, in order to show this, uh, all you do is you consider first a little bit of path. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to zoom in here in a little segment of that path, okay? Uh, that little segment here has a height, I'm going to call it small dy, and it has a length in the horizontal direction called dx. Now, if you use uh, Pythagorean, that means that the total length of this segment here, you can write as the square root of, you sum the squares of both sides. All right, that's okay. And well, now if you factor out a dx from that square root term, what you have is a dx in the front, and now you still have the square root of this term, one plus, now this is going to be dy divided by dx, and I square that. Now I've defined y prime to be equal to dy over dx. So at the end, the little segment of length then is simply written as one plus y prime, and I square that term, square root multiplied by dx. Now if you have a look at the expression I have up above for the time, that is exactly kind of this term right here. Now, we're interested in the time that it takes. So how would I write a little bit of time it takes to uh, to go over this distance ds. Well, I'd write the time as simply being uh, the length of that segment divided by the speed. Okay, and the length of that segment, we have it written right here. Okay, so our little bit of time then is going to be dx square root of 1 plus y prime squared and now divided by v. All right, now what you're interested in is not the little bit of time to go over this tiny segment. Rather, what we want to do is we want to add up all of the time, right? That's going to give me the total time, uppercase T. All right, that means you have to integrate this expression. Now I'm integrating over the variable dx. So dx goes from 0 
all the way to A. A is the last value that I have for the X. That's the final value. So now we're starting to look uh, really, really close to our final expression. I have the integral all the way to A from zero to A. I'm still left with this term in the denominator, which is square root of 2GY. And here all I have is the letter V. Okay, so now this point here, um, what we're gonna do in order to substitute uh, the expression, V is the speed here at this specific uh, instant in time. What speed am I taking to go across this distance DS? All right, so in order to find the speed, what we're going to use here is conservation of mechanical energy. I'll just write conservation of energy here. Now think about it here. If I started over here at zero and I'm basically dropping this height, right? I'm dropping some height h, which is basically simply equal to y because I'm taking y to be positive acting down. So again, there is no friction anywhere along this path. So what that means is that whatever potential energy you have initially, and all we have is mgh, uh, gets converted into kinetic energy. So when I'm at right this is point, all you're going to have is uh, kinetic energy, one half mv squared. Now you can see from this expression here, this gives us a nice simple expression for the speed in terms of the position that I that the bead is located along this wire, right? So right away, we should be able to write that the speed, um, just bring the two on the other side, take the square root. So we have the speed, which is square root of two GY. And now all we do is you substitute that expression for V down here in the denominator and lo and behold, look what we have. We have our nice expression now that matches our time. Okay, this is the exact same integral that we have up above here. Now keep in mind, I'm using y is equal to positive down here, so this is strictly a positive number here. I don't have to worry about it going negative under the square root term. All right, step two now is to find the function y of x that minimizes this total time. Now this is a minimization problem. We are looking for a stationary point of the total time, okay? So what we have to do now is use the Euler-Lagrange formalism in order to solve this problem, okay? This is exactly what Euler-Lagrange does for us, okay? And remember, all we're doing now is, is this, right? We're rewriting the time, all right? I'm gonna write it as an integral from zero to A of some function, I'm gonna call it the Lagrangian. Okay, and the Lagrangian in this case is a function of y. It's a function of y. It's also a function of y prime. Right, the Lagrangian is basically just the integrand of that uh, total integral that we have here. And if we're looking for a minimum, all we have to do now is solve the Euler-Lagrange equation, which says this. The partial derivative of that Lagrangian with respect to y minus d over dx dl over dy prime equals to zero, okay? That is what Euler-Lagrange does. If we find a function y that satisfies this Euler-Lagrange equation here, we have solved or we have found an extremum of the total time. And in this case, it will correspond to a minimum of that total time. All right, so our goal now is to solve this Euler-Lagrange equation where the Lagrangian, the L function here, is simply the integrand of that total time, right? So it's this guy right here, the square root of one plus y prime squared over square root of two gy. Um, now we're gonna do something a little bit different because solving this Euler-Lagrange equation is a little bit difficult. But what we're going to do is we're gonna use the fact that there is no straight dependence here on x. So that means that the partial derivative of L with respect to x is equal to zero. And rather than solving the Euler-Lagrange equation, we're gonna solve something called a second form of the Euler-Lagrange equation, also known as the Beltrami identity, uh, in order to solve this problem. It's because some of these terms are difficult to evaluate because we don't know the function y of x, right? If you knew this function, then we can evaluate all these derivatives without an issue. But if you don't know the explicit function, it's something that you're trying to find, it's a little bit uh, problematic to try to solve the problem just using standard Euler-Lagrange equation. But now let's go on the next page and show how we can combine 
Euler Lagrange with this fact right here to get to our second form. All right, now this is the proof for the Beltrami identity. And we're just, I just wrote it out here. I did this in a previous video, but I'm just gonna highlight the steps over here. So equation one is just the Euler-Lagrange equation. That's what we want to solve to obtain the function y of x. Uh, the second equation that I have here is the full derivative of our Lagrangian function with respect to x. What you have to do here is use the chain rule in, in order to write this out. So we have L, which is a function of Y and a function of Y prime only, all right? It has no dependence on X explicitly, okay? So that's why there's no partial derivative here with respect to X. Now, the next thing we do is, well, look at this first term here in that full derivative. What I'm going to do is simply use the First equation, the Euler-Lagrange term, it's exactly the same term that appears here. You can see that with the green. So I simply eliminate it from the second equation using the Euler-Lagrange equation. So that's okay. Now what I want to end up doing is rewrite now both of those terms here on the right-hand side of this two-prime equation. Now and what you can do in order to do that is to use the, the chain rule. For example, if you write the chain rule, so of so I'm taking the derivative with respect to x of two functions. One is y prime, the other one is dl over dy prime. All right? If you use the chain rule, you're going to get two terms to that. And if you write it out here, you can look at this for yourself later on, but both of these terms are exactly the same terms here that appear in my two prime equation. So what I'm going to do then is simply I can combine them into a single term that involves the full derivative. Now what you do is just bring everything to the left-hand side of the equation. That's what I've done here. And you notice both terms have the full derivative with respect to x. So guess what? I can factor that out, and that's what I'm doing over here. What I'm left with is this function in the square bracket. It's the Lagrangian minus y prime multiplied by the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to y prime, okay? And now that has to be equal to zero. The only way that's equal to zero is if the term in the square bracket is a constant, because if you take the derivative of a constant, you get zero. So therefore, this is known as the second form of the Euler-Lagrange equation, and it's a useful uh, equation to use if your Lagrangian has no explicit dependence on the variable x. Okay, it's also known as the Beltrami identity. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna use this in order to solve our problem because these terms are easy to evaluate. The Lagrangian I know directly from that expression and it's very easy for me to evaluate this partial derivative because I see it directly in the Lagrangian. So it's easy for me to take this partial derivative. All right, step three now is to obtain a differential equation for y of x or dy over dx. All right, what we're gonna do is we're gonna start with the second form of the Euler-Lagrange equation here, which I have L minus y prime multiplied by the partial derivative of uh, dl with respect to dy prime equals to a constant. All right, so let me first start with this term here in this red bracket here, because this is simply evaluating this partial derivative of L with respect to Y prime. And you see we have Y prime right here under the square root term. So this is an easy term to differentiate. All right, so right here, we're just gonna write DL, uh, DY prime. And now we simply differentiate this whole term with respect to y prime. You see this term here in the denominator, that simply behaves like a constant term because I'm differentiating with respect to y prime. All right, now this term here, well, you do the derivative of a square root gives you the same term minus a square root multiplied by the derivative of the inside gives me a 2y prime term, right? So this whole term here ends up simplifying here to y prime divided by square root of this whole thing. All right, and that's it, okay? Well, guess what else we have to do now? Now we're gonna go back to our second form of Euler-Lagrange and we substitute everything inside here. So let me go ahead and do that. So here's our L term. Uh, L was one 
plus y prime squared over square root of 2gy. Okay, minus now the y prime multiplied by this term that I just found. Okay, well, if I multiply y prime by this, I'm going to get y prime squared here. y prime squared. You can see that this is eventually going to simplify nicely for us. 2gy. And then again, there's the, still the square root term of 1 plus y prime squared. All right, remember our second form of Euler-Lagrange said all of this was equal to a constant. Well, let's just give it a name. Let's call it uppercase A. So that means all of this is simply uppercase A. Now, what you want to do is you want to put things on a common denominator. Okay, so if I do that here, the common denominator is going to be square root of 2gy. And then also this term, 1 plus y prime squared. Uh, if you do that, well, you're going to get 1 plus y prime squared. Here, the square roots are going to el get eliminated. And then you're going to get minus y prime squared. Well, that's convenient, and that's equal to my constant a. You can see that these terms here vanish, and that's a great simplification. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take this second square root term, and let's bring it up uh, at the top. So let me go ahead and just kind of start a new column over here. So what you're going to get here is 1 over square root of 2gy equals to a square root of 1 plus y prime squared. All right, great. Now think about it. If I square both terms, I am going to get rid of that square root term. So let's go ahead and do that. So you get 1 over... Oops, I just said I'm going to square it. Let's try that again. Uh, 2gy equals to a squared. And again, the square root terms vanish. I don't know why I keep doing that same mistake, but this becomes 1 plus y prime squared. All right, my last step now is, again, I'm going to group a couple of these other terms because I have a squared here. I had 1 over 2g over here. These are all constant terms. I just kind of just to clean it up a little bit. The whole goal is just to get to uh, one equation. So I'm gonna call this another constant, which I'm gonna introduce using the letter uppercase B, okay? It's nothing more than another constant term. Right? It'll just make my final differential equation that I'm trying to solve write it as neatly as possible. So this term here becomes B over Y, okay? And then this term here, the right-hand side, simply becomes one plus Y prime squared. All right, and that's it, folks. This is really the equation that we need to try to solve now to obtain what is the function y of x that satisfies this equation right here. Okay, and if we do that, that is also going to be the function that minimizes the time to go between our two fixed points. All right, the goal of step three was to obtain a differential equation for dy over dx, so we still have a little bit of work to do. So what we're gonna do here is just rewrite this. I'm gonna write y prime at least squared by itself, which means I'm bringing the one to the other side, so this simply becomes b minus one, and the b was over y like this. If you put things over a common denominator, you'll get b minus y over y. Uh, now think about what this left-hand side actually means. Y prime was nothing more than dy over dx. Now this term here is squared, don't forget. So that here equals to b minus y divided by y. Now if you want to take care of the square root term, you can do that. Again, you're just taking the square of each side. But one thing you have to remember is this plus or minus term, okay? And then you're going to be left with b minus y and divided by square root of y. Now, all these square roots should scare you. They scare me. How do I get a solution to this differential equation here? Uh, for example, to solve for the function y of x. Uh, not an easy thing to do, but at least we obtain the differential equation at this point. All right, so now you're left with a task that is not easy. How do you solve this equation, especially when you have these square root terms in the numerator and denominator? Well, my guess is the easiest way here is to think about a change of variable, right? First of all, if it's a square root term, maybe y should be equal to something squared. I think uh, that makes sense to me, right? 
Um, the other thing is, well, I do know like some identities. What if I had like um, maybe a term like this, right? Imagine you had B cosine or sine of squared of, a, of, a, of some angle phi, okay? And the reason that you do this, well, think about the numerator term. Here you'd have B minus B sine, right? So you could factor out as root B of that, and then you'd have one minus sine squared. So that would already simplify that term. If you think about the denominator term here, you'd take a square root of B. That would be common with the top. And then you could take a square root of sine squared and just left you with a sine function. So this might be kind of a good choice. And it's not obvious. You kind of need some experience to know how to kind of go around this. But uh, let's just proceed. So here I would have dy is equal to plus or minus. I have b minus y over square root of y. And then I'll just bring the dx on the other side for now. All right, so the goal now is just to make some substitutions. So what if this is y, what is dy? So we're making a change of variable. So b is simply a constant. Now, if you differentiate this, you get 2 sine of phi and cosine of phi, uh, d phi. OK, so this I can substitute here for the left-hand side. right? So you have 2b sine of phi, cosine of phi, uh, d phi. Uh, equals plus or minus. Now think about this term here. This will simplify greatly. This is b minus b sine squared of phi divided by, again, square root of b um, sine squared of phi. <laughs> uh, guess what? The, so the plus or minus remains. Guess what this simplifies over here? Again, the root b's will cancel out everywhere. You can simply get rid of those, which is nice. Uh, you still have a b on the left-hand side. We'll worry about that in a minute. Now, this term here becomes what? Square root of 1 minus sine squared. Okay. And now this term here simply becomes sine of phi. And 1 minus sine squared, that's simply cos squared. So at the end, this very complicated term, right, becomes plus or minus cos phi over sine of phi. Now look what else you have. You had a cos phi on the other side, right? So you can eliminate this and you can eliminate this. And we're just about done here. Oh, I, I almost forgot. I see this dx here. I can't forget to include that term. We've made a change of variable for y. We haven't touched the dx term. All right. It would be painful if you made a mistake at this point. All right. So now we simply proceed. All right, we have to group together all the terms here. So let's group together the sine of phi, there's one here. There's going to be one coming in from uh, this term over here. So the left-hand side then becomes 2b sine squared of phi uh, d phi. Okay, that's manageable. Equals to plus or minus dx. All right, so far so good. Now again, this squared term, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to use the double angle uh, identity. So I can replace this, right? This is simply 2b. Um, sine squared, you can write as one half, one minus cosine of two times that angle. Okay, and do that and d phi. This will make the uh, term we'll be able to integrate now. Okay. All right. So now all we have to do now is uh, integrate both sides of this, and then we should have an expression of x in terms of this angle phi. And guess what? I already have an expression for y in terms of the angle phi by this uh, first replacement that I did. So what we're, we're going to have now are two functions, x and y. They're both going to be a function of this angle phi, but we have a parametric solution now to this differential equation. All right, first thing we could do is uh, cancel this out. What you then do is you integrate both sides, all right, because this is uh, pretty straightforward. Um, the first term here is uh, a 1. So that means that here you have the constant b in the front. That means this term here is going to be equal to phi. Uh, the second term now, this is just cosine of a function. So it's going to be 1 half sine of the same function. All right, and this side now is plus or minus x and then plus some integration constant. So c is just, again, another constant, uh, integration constant in this time. All right, we're just about done. 
Uh, what you can then do is just uh, neat this up a little bit, maybe multiply by two uh, over on each side. Okay, so what this looks like now is B, this here becomes two phi minus sine of two phi. It'll just get the equations looking nice and symmetric. This is two X plus two C. <laughs> All right, and maybe the last thing, maybe I'll just actually get rid of the two just for these terms. And maybe let's bring it down in front of the B. Okay, so which is nice because look what we have over here. We have basically an expression for X. We have plus or minus X plus that constant is equal to this B over two was B was some constant two times phi minus sine of two times phi. That's one equation. All right, so let me go ahead and just write a one here. That's for the X. Uh, what else? We started out with Y is equal to, well, what do we have? B sine squared of phi. Again, using that double angle equation, well, think about what you can do. You can rewrite this as one minus uh, cosine of two phi. Okay. We're gonna call this equation two. Now we're just about done. The only thing we have to do now is take care of this uh, integration constant. Okay. Now what we need to do for that is to use our initial condition, right? The initial condition was one of our endpoints, which said that we started out at zero and zero. Okay. So that's going to be important and that's going to allow us to determine what is this value of C. All right. So from two, what we see is that when Y equals to zero, uh, the only way you're going to satisfy this is when phi equals to zero. Okay, now think about putting that now into our first equation, right? If you go back now to the first equation to determine that integration constant, you get plus or minus x plus c uh, is equal to b over 2. And we know that when phi equals to 0, the position x equals to 0. So this term here becomes 0, and this here is plus or minus 0 plus c uh, equals to 0. So this is only satisfied if... Uh, that integration constant is equal to zero. Now for the plus or minus side, well, if you think about just the motion of the particle, right? Uh, the particle is moving in the positive x direction. So although there are two solutions, we are just going to keep our physical solution, which is in the positive x direction. Um, so we're just about done, right? So we know that integration constant is gone. Uh, what we do now at the end is simply clean this up a little bit. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna call uh, R equals to B over two, and I'm also going to call theta equals to two phi. And if you do this, what you're going to do is you're gonna clean up the equations nicely. And at the end, they're gonna look like the equations, and they are in fact the equations of a cycloid. So we're gonna be left with this. X is going to be left with R. Instead of two phi here, I simply have theta and then minus sine of theta. All right, and for the y equation here, again, looking at equation two, uh, the b over two gets substituted with our new variable I call r, and this becomes one minus cosine of the angle theta. All right, mathematically, these equations represent, they're the parametric equation uh, that describe a cycloid shape. Now let's go on the next page to describe the geometry of the cycloid and how it relates to these two equations. All right, so the solution that we obtained for the X and Y coordinates here, again, that is the curve that minimizes the time to go between our two endpoints, which are the zero, zero point and our endpoint here of five and one, okay? Um, now, what those curves describe is the green line here shown on the screen. Now, how you generate that, what you have to picture now is a circle, okay, that has a certain radius, which we're going to call R, which is the variable that appears in our cycloid equation. And you got to imagine that there's a point that's glued to the circle. And now as this circle starts to move to the right, okay, at constant speed, you imagine uh, the shape that gets traced out by this orange point as it moves along. So let me show you the video and show you what that looks like. We'll make it go nice and slow so you can see. So the orange point is fixed here and it just rotates and draws out this 
curve until it hits the end point. Now I just have it on repeat so you could see it a few times. But now if we focus on a couple of points, uh, we can look at uh, a little bit more specific about how the equations get substituted here to draw out this shape. All right, here are some still shots now. So this is my initial position. Here's my circle with a certain radius R. Again, that radius is defined by here. And I wanna go all the way to the end point. Now, let me just show you, for example, an angle that's approximately equal to uh, 90 degrees, right? So that circle has rotated by pi over two. And now that point uh, has shifted a little bit, right? Here's my angle of pi over two. And if I continue to move, um, if I continue to move at some point, the angle is equal to pi. You substitute the angle pi in here. Uh, that simplifies a lot of things because sine of pi equals to zero. And what you're left with now is x is equal to r times pi. That's shown here. That's how far you are from the origin. And in the y coordinate, um, you substitute pi here. What you're going to get is 2r to be the distance along this vertical axis. All right, well, we gotta keep going, right? If you keep on advancing that angle theta, at some point, we're going to hit our end point, which in this case here, I have it programmed for five, one. That was the end point of the problem. Now you can see that this angle here is actually a little bit less. This maximum angle is a little bit less than two pi, right? This is kind of my maximum angle once I've reached that end point. If I would continue to go all the way to two pi, this curve would continue right up until you hit the axis because you could check that out. When you substitute two pi into the y equation here, you could see you're going to get zero for that coordinate, but we don't quite get there for this specific problem. All right, my goal now is to calculate the time for these three curves. Uh, so we're gonna start with our fastest time, which is the uh, brachistochrone curve. Uh, the green one here on the screen, I'm gonna show you how do you actually calculate the total time for the bead to go from the origin all the way to the point of five one. All right, how do we do this? All right, so I'm gonna start with the brachistochrone curve. Now what we have to do first is we have to determine two things. We have to determine what is R for this uh, curve and also what is going to be the maximum value of theta, okay? The maximum value of theta, again, is related to this endpoint here. So what we do is we use our boundary condition here. So imagine we substitute our endpoint here. So X is five, so we have five equals to R theta minus sine of theta. And then what else? We have y is equal to one. So we'd have one equals two in our second equation here. This would be r, this is one minus cosine of theta. All right, so again, we have two equations here and two unknowns. One way to eliminate the uh, unknowns, for example, to eliminate r, I could divide one equation by the other. So let's do that. So imagine you were gonna divide one equation by the other. Here you'd have five, and here you'd have theta minus sine of theta and divided by one minus cosine of theta. All right, so what you have to do is you have to solve this equation. It's a little bit difficult. So one way to kind of simplify this a little bit is I'm just gonna bring this whole term here on the other side. Um, so we have five, uh, one minus cosine of theta. And here we're still gonna have theta minus uh, sine of theta. And this is really going to allow us to find what is the theta max here. Uh, whenever we have x, for example, equals to five and y equals to one, right? That is our goal. So we need to solve this equation. And what I did here is I used some software just to plot the left-hand side and the right-hand side. And when they cross each other, both of those curves, that is when I have a solution. Okay, so let me show you what that looks like. Okay, so we have to start plugging things into our total time equation. So we first need to calculate what y prime is. The definition of y prime is dy over dx. I have y and x in terms of theta, so maybe it's easier to evaluate dy d theta, and then also dx uh, d theta. All right, that's probably easier to do that step. All right, so let's start with this dy over d theta. Uh, this here should be r. You take the derivative of this function with respect to theta. You should get sine of theta d theta. Okay, divided by now dx over d theta. So you have to differentiate this guy here with respect to theta. Uh, what you get for that one is simply r, and this is simply going to be one 
minus cosine of theta d theta. All right, now we're going to cancel out a bunch of terms. You see the r's leave. Uh, let me put the parentheses over here. We see the d theta terms leave. And that is kind of nice. We're left with a friendly expression here that looks like sine of theta divided by 1 minus cosine of theta. Okay, that's a good start. Uh, the next thing we have to do, so now we have to take 1 plus, we have to square this whole thing. All right, so let's evaluate that term. So it's 1 plus the term that appears in the square root. It's 1 plus y prime squared. So you have to do 1 plus, now this whole term squared. So that means that this guy here is sine squared theta. Now this term looks really messy, but let me just write it as this. Now don't get discouraged at this point. You just simply have to do some math. Now we put things on a common denominator. This is 1 minus cosine of theta squared. And now the numerator here will become 1 minus cosine of theta squared plus sine squared of theta. Okay, so far so good. What you could do now is expand the squared term over here. Okay, that's going to help us later on. And here you're going to be left with 1 minus 2 cosine of theta plus cosine squared of theta plus sine squared of theta. So you should see something appearing here that we'll be able to simplify. All right, you see we have cosine squared plus sine squared. Well, guess what? All of those are simply equal to one. So we could simplify that expression. All right, so we finally write down the, uh, la the last expression for this term over here. So again, you have to group both of those. We have a one and a one here. So this becomes a two, you can factor that out. And this becomes one minus cosine of theta. Look at this divided by 1 minus cosine of theta squared. Well, that's kind of convenient. So this really simplified quite a bit. So this whole term just becomes this. All right, now this is where the magic happens now. We have our definitions of x and y. I found this complicated term that appears in our time expression. And we also have our dx over here that we have to worry about. But look at all these terms here, 1 minus cosine theta, 1 minus cosine theta. They are actually proportional to y. So let's use that definition to simplify. So let's leave the 2 here. What can I substitute 1 minus cosine theta? Right? You can see from here, 1 minus cosine theta is simply y divided by r. This is y divided by r. So that's kind of nice. What about dx? r1 minus cosine theta, that is the definition of y. So this here is actually y multiplied by d theta. So now all you have to do is to evaluate the time is we have t is equal to, now we've made a change of variable from dx, we're going to d theta. So our integral now is gonna go from theta equals to zero all the way to the maximum value that we obtained previously. All right, now we have the square root. So let me go ahead and put that term, square root of one plus y prime squared. Well, that's exactly this term over here. So we have two r divided by y, okay? Let's multiply by the dx term. dx is nothing more than y d theta. Now all of this must be divided by this. So we have square root of two g and let's just leave y here. <laughs> The reason I'm not substituting y for this complicated expression is because I've done this previously and it just adds more work because look what you have here. Is you have this y and here I have a square root of y and here I have another square root of y. Actually all the y's end up canceling out. Also this two can cancel with this one and now let's bring all the constant terms to the front. So we're left with the time is this integral from theta a zero to theta max. And here, well, so I just said, let's bring the constant terms to the front, but I don't have a lot of room, but there are only two constant terms. There's the radius, and then there's little g right here. And the only thing I'm left to integrate is d theta. Well, this is a super simple expression. Look at this, that the total time boils down to this simple expression. Wow, so all we do now is we substitute our two previous values that we had that we found numerically in order to find this, right? So we had our radius, which was equal to 0. Uh, what was it? 8, 9, 
Oh boy, I forget what it was. Oh, 895 rather. Divided by little g, I'm just going to take 9.8. And this multiplied by theta max, the theta max value is 4.595. And you calculate that and all you get is 1.39 seconds approximately. That's the time it takes for that beat to slide down um, that brachistochrone curve. Now I want to compare this time now to the two other curves that we have there. I want to show you that it is a minimum at least compared to those two other curves. All right, for our second curve, which is the shortest path between those two endpoints, um, we could do this using simple kinematics or we can actually still use this expression. So let's go ahead and use our time expression right here. Uh, that means we need to evaluate what y prime is and the definition is simply the slope of that line. And the slope is constant, right? It's dy over dx. It's the rise over the run. Uh, the rise is b and the run is a. So that's it for that one. Now notice I have it positive right here and that's because of this coordinate system. I have positive y going down. So right away that means that y is simply a linear expression, right? It's proportional to x. So all you have to do now is take both of those expressions and guess what? You have to simply substitute them into here and then perform that integration. So let's go ahead and do that. So we just got to be careful when we write stuff out. So here we have 0 to a. And now we have this square root term of 1 plus y prime. Well, that's b over a. So that's b squared over a squared. Divided by square root of 2g and multiplied by y. So instead of writing y, I'll just write b over a multiplied by x. And I still have my dx term. Now... All of these terms here, let's take out all the constant terms from the integration. I'm also going to write this one here on a common denominator. So let's go ahead and do that. So this term right here at the top is going to be a squared plus b squared divided by a squared divided by. Now, how do we take out all the constant terms from the bottom here? This is simply going to be 2g and then we have a b over a. Okay. And at the end, we're left with this integral from 0 to a of dx and divided by square root of x. So this integration is actually pretty straightforward. So we can group also many of these terms together right here. So I'm going to just make one giant square root term. I have a squared plus b squared. Now you have to be a little bit careful. a squared over here. What else? I have 2g over here. And here I'm going to have b over a. Well, guess what? That Right away, I could just cancel out one of those a's. That'll simplify that expression. And now this integral here simply becomes 2 square root of x evaluated between those limits. All right, so let's keep going here. So our one of our expressions for time now, I've simplified this a little bit. This is a squared plus b squared. Um, what else? We have 2ab multiplied by little g. And now outside of that square root term, I have 2, and this becomes square root of a. So let's think about how we could simplify this a little bit. Um, if I bring this 2 inside the square root term, it becomes a 4. So at the end, I'm going to be left with 2a squared plus b squared. What else? I'm still going to have a b. Look at this a. If I bring this square root term inside here, guess what? I get an a, and it's going to cancel with this one. So here you're simply going to be left with uh, b multiplied by little g. Okay, and that's it. <laughs> that's our expression. So now you could substitute our values. So we have 2. Our a value is 5, so this becomes 5 squared. Oops, let me not close that bracket right away. Uh, plus b squared, that's 1 squared. All of this now divided by, um, what else do we have? Oh, b is 1 times little g, which is 9.8. Okay, substitute that in the calculator. And for the straight line curve, look what we get. We get a time of approximately 2.3 seconds. All right, that is nearly like 9, 0.9 seconds slower than the brachistochrone curve, right? So much slower to take the shortest path curve for this problem. All right, for our last curve, this is what we have, a straight segment where you just fall, and then we have a 
place or this long segment where it travels at constant speed. So let's just calculate both of these times using simple kinematics, and then you simply have to add them up at the end to get the total time. Uh, the time t1 where you drop a certain distance b, right? So you have y equals to b, and that has to be equal to 1 half uh, gt squared, and that's t1. Um, so the time t1 then, so you just isolate here, so you have 2b divided by little g, and take the square root of that term. That's it. That's our time t1. All right, time t2, we're traveling at constant speed, right? So we have that the speed is constant, and the speed then is going to be what for this section, right? Um, the speed is going to be the distance divided by the time, okay? So think about our distance now. We have the distance, which is a, and now divided by the time, which is t2. All right, so right away, you should be able to write that t2 is simply my distance divided by the speed. Well, how do I find the speed for the section, this flat section right here? It's going to be whatever speed it acquired when it was dropping. But when it was dropping, well, the speed here has to be equal to g multiplied by t1. So all you do now is you substitute your expression. The a stays there, and now the speed is little g and multiplied by t1. Now just be a little bit careful here because you're dealing with the square root. So little g, now I'm going to introduce that square root. And since it's in the denominator t1, you have to kind of swap all of those, right? So you're going to have little g at the top, and then you're going to have 2b at the bottom. And that's it, okay? So my total time t then as an expression, I would write it as t1 plus t2, and these are the two values. Uh, my value of a is equal to 5, uh, b is equal to 1, and you substitute everything inside here. And what you're going to find for this time here is a time of 1.58 seconds, okay? So you notice that this one is still slower. The brachistochrone answer was 1.39. The straight line section was the slowest at 2.3 seconds. So here at least I've showed you for these three curves, the brachistochrone is by far uh, the fastest curve to get from uh, the origin all the way to 5 comma 1 if gravity is the only thing acting on you, right? We neglect friction. All right, folks, that's it for this Brachistochrone video. It was a little bit long, but hopefully you appreciate it and you learned something uh, in this video. Thanks for watching.